Hello, my name is Craig Shifton, and today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the future. Back in 2009, one of my favorite bands, Phoenix, released a new album called Wolfgang Amadeus Phoenix. And just before it came out, uh, Thomas Mars from the band did an interview with the Australian radio presenter, Zan Rowe. And she asked them what kind of album they'd set out to make. And he told her that they had wanted to make something futuristic, something that sounded like the future. Uh, she said, how do, you, how do you do that? And he explained that when they were working in the studio, they knew they'd made something futuristic if they made something that made them feel uncomfortable, something that wasn't, wasn't familiar to them. Now, this is a weird goal as an artist to set yourself to, that you are trying to make things that you don't like yet. Uh, but I think the theory behind it is sound, it's reasonable. Because if you're a student of rock history, as those guys clearly are, uh, then you would learn early and often, you would be told over and over again, that many of rock music's masterpieces were written off by their initial audiences as unlistenable garbage. You will get to know the story of the Velvet Underground, or the story of Bikini Kill, or the story of Yoko Ono's amazing albums of the 1970s, or David Bowie's Low. And the moral of all, all these stories is the same. Uh, the music of the future sounded weird to people in the past. They didn't like it and they didn't understand it because they don't know what we know now. And from this, it stands to reason that if you want to make music for the future, then it ought to make people confused or at least a little bit uncomfortable in the present. That's why producer and musician Brian Eno didn't get too upset when his series of ambient albums got bad reviews and sold slowly when they were first released in the early 1980s. In a, a now very famous interview with the LA Times, he told the story of the Velvet Underground who were routinely booed off of stages in San Francisco and Los Angeles when they first started playing in the late 1960s. Um, Eno explained that Lou Reed once told him that uh, the Velvet Underground's first album sold only 30,000 copies, which is a tiny amount, um, but he believed that every one of those people, people probably went out and started a band not long after. So it wasn't popular, but it turned out to be something much more important, influential. And Eno wondered if his ambient albums might not be a little bit like that. He said, I console myself by thinking that sometimes these things generate their rewards in a second-hand way. Eno's line of thinking here, his, his, uh, his reasoning, um, shows the influence of the history of the avant-garde through the 19th and 20th century. Many modernist artists, like the ones associated with the Bauhaus in Germany or the constructivist movement in the early Soviet Union, or the situationists in Paris in the 1960s, set out to actively invent the future. They believed, or at least hoped, that they were creating models or prototypes for a way of life that would one day be realized. And for this, they were willing to put up with a certain amount of ridicule and indifference in their present, and even accept, to a degree, the uncomfortable idea that their work might not find its true purpose or its true application until long after they were dead. When I thought about artists like this, suffering in their present for the sake of a future that might never come, the misunderstood artist, the artist who's ahead of his or her time. I used to sometimes think of the, the imagine that they were a bit like the person in the alien invasion movie, who, like the one person who knows that the aliens are coming or that everyone is being transformed into pods but can't get anyone to believe them. And so I was, I was astounded a little while later to find that uh, that one of my fa in one of my favorite alien invasion movies, in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the 1977 film by Steven Spielberg, he cast uh, Richard Dreyfuss as, as Roy Neary, the, the, the one person, the one person who knows. And when he was directing uh, Dreyfuss in the role, he encouraged him to read up on the, the life of Vincent van Gogh uh, and actually modeled the character on what he'd, read, uh, what he'd read about the life of Vincent van Gogh. And this makes a lot of sense. Because, uh, because Van Gogh is the ultimate modernist martyr, the person we're most likely to think of when we, when we think of an artist who is somehow ahead of their time. Because now, as we know, his work is universally adored, but when he died, he had no reason to believe that this would ever be the case. There's a great song about this. Uh, in his 1971 hit, Vincent, the American soft rock singer Don, Don McLean serenades the painter from the future. He sings, they did not listen, they did not know how, Perhaps they'll listen now. And then in the second verse, he thinks better of it. He thinks, well, maybe, you know, those, those million dollar price tags on the paintings uh, are no consolation 
for, a, for, for, the, for, for Vincent's suffering, for the society that failed him and countless other visionaries. Um, and so he sings in the last verse, they would not listen, they're not listening still, perhaps they never will. Listening to Don McLean's song, I like to imagine that if I'd been there in, in Van Gogh's 19th century, I might have seen what, what the other people couldn't see. I might have saved Vincent's life and made a smart art investment and managed to avoid looking stupid in the future. But the truth is that I would probably screw it up too. I know this because a couple of months ago I found myself on a judging panel and the, the, the reason I was there was to award a prize to one of a number of third year performance and media art students. And I'd just seen them present their work on stage. And I watched the whole thing and I made a note of the ones that I thought were good, the ones that moved me or made me laugh or made me want to dance or whatever, uh, and, uh, and dismissed the ones that I thought were no good and voted accordingly. Simple, right? And during the judging process, I got in an argument with one of the other judges who'd actually voted for all the artists that I, that I disliked the most. And I asked him why he voted for them. And he said, because they made me feel uncomfortable. And, and I think now that that guy is probably on the right side of history. Um, because, you know, the, the, the patrons who, who um, ignored Van Gogh, the, the hippies who booed the Velvet Underground off stage in San Francisco, no one wants to be those people today. The, the general conclusion, the only general conclusion we can learn from all these stories, all these art and music fables, is that we'll know it's good if we don't like it yet. <laughs>